In this session, uh, we're going to talk about something that is very important in creating intelligent communities, and that is change. Uh, intelligent communities usually means change because you have to do things in a new way. And although we have emphasized technology in the past as being very, very important, and it is, in the end, it comes down to having organizations, people, societies, culture change. And so we really want to explore that a little bit in order to understand how you can really uh, create an intelligent community, which goes, as I said, beyond the technology. And we have uh, four distinguished panelists, of which three are here. It turns out that everybody on this stage uh, has come from at least as far away as uh, Virginia uh, and, or, and, uh, and overseas, uh, being at the Netherlands or uh, Austria or Hungary. And, but I guess New York City and Manhattan is even further somehow than those locations. So why don't we get started? Also, uh, it'll be interesting to get the view of uh, the remaining panelists, because we, 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 neither of us is an elected official, although we deal with elected officials all the time. So why don't we get started and discuss, uh, maybe, uh, Joe, you can begin by giving an example of a of a successful instance of change with all kinds of various stakeholders, what you went through, uh, how it was successful, and talk about how you dealt with the problem a little bit, keeping, keeping in mind we don't have a lot of time. Right. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Danville, Virginia, just to put it in context, uh, is a city of 43,000 in the middle of the state of Virginia, right on the border with North Carolina. And in that part of North uh, Virginia, North Carolina, and extending south to South Carolina and, and west to Tennessee, uh, there are many communities like ours that uh, worked for decades on an industrial base, in our case, that was made up of textiles and tobacco. Uh, we were a market for tobacco, and for decades, um, it was a place where farmers came to bring their tobacco and an auction system uh, to sell that tobacco to wholesalers and, and tobacco manufacturers. <clears throat> and uh, our economy changed dramatically uh, when the textile trades, the Dan River Mills, uh, which is one of the America's largest textile companies, uh, started declining and went bankrupt eventually and the tobacco uh, companies left. Uh, that left us with a community uh, that we describe as a mill town without a mill. Um, and if you're familiar with uh, mill towns in the south of the United States, uh, the populations, uh, by virtue of having worked in these mills, uh, are semi-skilled, um, not high-skilled. So you're left without an industry and a population that has low uh, skills that don't lend themselves well to new industry. So that's the context. Um, when these major employers went under, uh, the community pulled together with the help of a foundation, uh, studied uh, the strengths and weaknesses, much like you've heard the experience in other communities, and rallied um, stakeholders in the community to address what we should do going forward. And I'd have to acknowledge, unlike many of the other communities we've heard from, we're just at the beginning of that journey. Uh, we're a decade after these mills started closing, <clears throat> but uh, we are recruiting new industry and developing new opportunities. Um, so I think um, two things I'd take away, uh, just lessons learned is, all the strategies you undertake need to fit your community, and that depends on the demographics of your community, the nature of the workforce, uh, the opportunities there. You can't take a cookie cutter approach. Uh, but regardless of the particulars, you've got to engage uh, stakeholders. In our case, a challenge is that being a mill town, we're not an assertive community with the tradition of the population coming uh, together. And so uh, there's that. Uh, to overcome, but I think um, 
our, our success to get us to this point <clears throat> was recognizing that we needed to transition to a forward-looking economy and pulling the major stakeholders, of which the local government is just one. Yeah, very interesting. And it, it, something we've seen today in the program is that often a kind of failure leads to success, if you will. You've got to go down, and then you can come up again. And it takes a kind of a crisis, almost a recognition of the problem by the community before you can start to overcome it. Ingrid, what about go across the pond and go to Austria and uh, sort of change, I guess, is very important as it is here. Can you give us an example of change or some of your experiences and, and how you tried to work with different stakeholders and implementing moves toward what we might call an intelligent community? Well, uh I'd like to give one sentence before to the city of Vienna. We have 1.7 uh, million inhabitants and uh, administration <coughs> staff of 65,000, which may seem enormous, but we offer services to our citizens, citizens from before they were born until um, after the end of their life. Uh, it's medical care, it's housing, it's schooling, so whatever you name it, we've got it. So this accounts for this rather large number of staff and for a rather extensive administration. Uh, about 10 years ago, we thought about uh, what about teleworking, introducing into the administration of the city of Vienna. And uh, at first, we just thought, well, it's a nice way to, to use ICT, information and communication technology, for the benefit of the employees. And nobody thought really about whether there would be a change or not. It was just, they just thought it was another way of working. But uh, we finally found out after the first stage that uh, it was a very substantial change of management culture. It changed from, or it had to change in order to be effective, uh, to change from a management by headcount, <coughs> are you all there? Yes, fine. To, to a management by trust, meaning whether this person works in the office or whether he or she works at home or at any other place, you had to trust him or her that the quality of work was done, that the, the, the amount of work was like it was agreed on. And for that, you had to change also not only your management style, but also your organizational style. You had to had, uh, have clear-cut work packages, or, or at least clearly defined borders where one work package fit into the other. And uh, so after a time, we had a lot of stakeholders, as you can imagine. It was not only the chief executive's office, it was the CIO of office, which where I was from. There was the personal uh, office, there was the internal revision, there was the unions, there was the representatives of the employees, there were the, the teleworkers themselves, and 14 departments who sent people to, to try to test out, to get the feeling of teleworking. <laughs> so a lot of different stakeholders, and I'd say none of them was averse to telework, but they simply didn't know what it was about. So just in order to, to get some, some, some outside view, and not to, as we could say, stew in our own Jews, mm -hmm. not knowing what the Jews would be about, we, we, we tried to get uh, two academics from the Technical University of Vienna uh, who were experts in the field of telework. But uh, we found that while going on with the project, which took three years, I must say, uh, we found that our expertise grew daily. And uh, finally, we introduced telework to make a, a short story out of it. And uh, the two academic uh, supervisions, supervisors uh, found that whatever happened in the city of Vienna was not different from, let's say, another private enterprise or a big business enterprise like, for example, IBM or any, any others. Mm -hmm. So uh, our idea was to keep all the stakeholders in one round, to have regular meetings, to have a good plan, but be sure that the plan is adaptive. Because when you don't know really where you have to go, you have to have an adaptive, adaptive plan. 
and uh, not, to, not to allow rumors by having a very intense information and reporting management and have repeat loops and, and get people involved and not allowing people to be quiet. They should be either pro or against, but they should have their opinion and they should voice it. That's very interesting. I'm pleased to know that you called in some academics, by the way. So, uh, <laughs> but uh, uh, seriously, this, this whole notion of learning and of kind of expanding the domain of your, uh, of your attention if you, is, is quite interesting. You start out just thinking you were going to do one thing and it turned out to have an impact on the whole ecosystem, which is very interesting. And if we turn now also to Europe and we look at the Netherlands, Joe, did you, what's been your experience in change and can you give us examples of how this, how you implemented change in your own context? Okay. So first to say, I'm, I'm a, a little bit of a, of a geek, right? I'm, I'm an EE, I'm a double E, so an engineer. So we're at the- You uh, right in this building. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we're the guys that provide you the broadband and all the services on top of that. So my organization is, uh, is working with industry and academia. We try to build this transforming um, uh, ground where we can build uh, new devices and new services. Um, <clears throat> and we do this in the open innovation model. So that's, that's the, uh, the key word, I think, in, in our operation. Um, talking about change, I heard the word stakeholders and I, I heard the word uh, change a few times here. I think the sense of urgency is needed and, and change comes about, especially also in industry, when they see that the innovation that they need to bring the next service to the marketplace is, uh, is going to be beyond their own, um, their own capability, their own R&D capability. And that's why we're there in a sense and many others like us to, to try to, uh, to translate that, that urgency they see uh, in collaborating outside of their own borders um, at, at a cost that is um, acceptable, at a speed that is needed to get to time in market, but at a level that is pre-competitive. And I think that's, that's what we try to do, is try to them and ourselves to understand in terms of technology and, and deployment of that in, in, the, in the services later on, what is gonna be pre-competitive and what is gonna be needed in, in their own R&D and business units to, uh, to make uh, the difference. So because I think Robert said it there, the, the, the companies often are uh, fighting each other on the marketplace. They're fierce competitors, but on our ground, which is a neutral ground, they work together uh, and stand behind the same roadmap. And I think uh, that's what we've done in Eindhoven with Holst Center, which is not five years old, it's, it's pretty young. But the model is there uh, and has been proven over a couple of uh, decades that it works when you get the sense of urgency lined up with the pre-competitive nature of what you can do. And that is a change, a change pattern in many R&D organizations. And, We've seen it happen in the semiconductor industry, that's where you know, my home base is. Mm -hmm. But uh, we see the same coming about now in, the, in say, the pharmaceutical industry, in the food industry, and the, the borders of innovation open up. And I think, it's, it's, for me, it's, it's interesting to be in this, in this setting where the, the local authorities can help to do that. And I think for us, creating the, the atmosphere of our research and being in an area where, where you can find and you can embed it in a way that the, the workers like to come there and, and to the community is changing towards this model is, is very inspiring. So you really started from the technology mm -hmm. and the geek side mm -hmm. and then moved to the rest of the community mm -hmm. as opposed to the kind of community coming in and then you sort of looked at the technology. Yeah. Wouldn't that be great? I mean, if we move together at the same target and I right. think that that's the tough part, you know, we can, we can put a headset on, on Robert's skull and try to measure his brain waves which is fun for us. Mm -hmm. I don't think that contributes anything to the community. But if you, if you work together with, a, for instance, a, a hospital close, close by in Eindhoven, which is Kempenhagen, a very well-known hospital for, say, neural uh, disorder and, and brain diseases, we can couple that technology to the needs they have in telemonitoring and all the nice examples that you've seen from Eindhoven and other places. And so that's, that's where the community needs to meet. If, if, if you can, can try to understand the local impact you have with your technology, even though, like ourselves, we're very internationally uh, um, active, we can deploy it back into the local community. And, and I think that's the, one of the key performance indicators we have as an institute mm -hmm. is to see that the local impact is there. And then, of course, you know, if you do that, then the locals will not be voted out of office, I guess, because they can see the impact of, of what they're supporting. Joe, if, if I turn to you, it seemed to me the pattern was a little different in your context. You recognized there was a crisis and it came from the community, not from the technology side initially. I mean, in, in the field of change, uh, people look at the sources of change, the sources of innovation. 
And on the one hand, it often in technology comes from the technology providers. Speeches. Comes from the technology providers. And, but uh, in your case, what were the sources of change? Where did they come from? And then how did you actually go about gaining the intelligence to put in an intelligent community in the sense of technology side? Because the pattern, I think, is very different in your neck of the woods than it was in Eindhoven. Uh, <clears throat> a, a local foundation funded a study which was very well done, but um, uh, was at a high altitude, so to speak. And I'm a local government guy, so mm -hmm. I like concepts and vision, but you have to operationalize mm -hmm. things. And I'm very curious among those attending this conference uh, who have done things and succeeded, to what degree was a plan formalized with roles and responsibilities assigned and accountabilities if you have the need to engage stakeholders beyond the local government or beyond one entity? How do I get you to do what you say uh, needs to be done and you keep me accountable for what I need to be done? In our case, uh, the city has um, its own electric utility uh, which, depending on where you are in the United States, may be an uncommon or a common service. In our case, uh, in Virginia, it's not common. Uh, but having an electric utility, we installed our broadband network uh, and overbuilt it so that it served initially for our utility needs for substation, uh, automation, that degree of uh, the smart grid also connected all of our buildings and our schools so you'd have very robust point-to-point -point connectivity between all the public entities and then ultimately attach that to a smart grid uh, down to automated or advanced meters uh, for electric water and gas um, and then are trying to use that that foundation and we have an open access system so any uh, telecommunications provider can come onto our system and they pay us a share of the revenues they earn. So our model is not to be a direct service provider but an enabler through this network. Uh, and our network is attached to a regional network that provides connectivity to any point in the United States or Europe for that matter. So in that uh, silo, uh, as a local government, we've done what we can. We're trying to promote knowledge and, and uh, uh, use of that technology. Uh, the, the challenge is then how, how do you get the other pieces in place because it's not just putting a broadband network in. Uh, there's workforce training. Uh, there's all kinds of things. So how do you engage other stakeholders and uh, not get into their business or dictate what they should do. They know what they need to do, but get a consensus about what needs to be done and formalize that process so you have a community strategic plan with uh, all the actions needed and those responsible to operationalize a vision. That's, that's the challenge, and I'd say we're a little ways away from accomplishing that. Do you have general agreement among the major stakeholders now on what needs to be done? Uh, to the degree that high-level analysis I mentioned uh, identified, they, they were obvious things, mm -hmm. uh, but it, it put it down in paper and, and everybody agreed, and those, many of those things have been accomplished. But how do you go to the next level? Ingrid, if we get back uh, to your experiences, one of the uh, one of the lessons that seems to come out of what you just mentioned is the need for an organization to be adaptive or to learn or to grow. And did that come easy for you? Did you go from looking at the not small issue but specific issue of teleworking to the larger issue of cultural change? How did you actually make the leap from the specific to the broader, uh, more pervasive kind of change that you seem to have implemented in Vienna? Well, I, I'd say I, because it was my face to the customer in these telework things, I was lucky in that we had a bit of time. There was no time pressure at all, because the city simply wanted to find out would it work, 
how would it work, under what circumstances would it work, or not. And so uh, I could, or we, together with the teleworkers and the stakeholders, we could do it step by step. So it, was, it didn't come overnight. Mm -hmm. It was a process that was developed by the stakeholders themselves. And they, they, they had the time to realize, well, uh, there should be another step. And shouldn't we think about that as well? And if we do that, there follows con conclusively another step. So it, it was a lucky project in that, because we did not have a time pressure. But I've seen other pro uh, projects where uh, there should have been uh, m even more time pressure than, than we had, because it was by, by the finances or whatever it was, or, or by political decision and so on. Um, we found that uh, whatever it was, take the people and talk to them. Talk to them, talk to them. And most of all, listen to them. Give them the chance to be adaptive as, uh, adaptive as persons. Then the organization will follow. That's, that's one of the main points. You never can act like a tank driving over people, even, even if you have got the strength, or even if you have got the power. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you would leave a burned earth. But uh, no, but that's, that's impossible. If you want to do a good project, you must have living people behind you. And they carry the own organization. So if, if, if we start from the technology side, and then you have to communicate to a whole community beyond, was that an easy thing to do? Was it readily accepted? Was there resistance? How does someone who's grounded in technology and understands, at least from one's own perspective, mm -hmm. the value you bring to a community and a host of different services? Was it easy to sell the rest of the community, or did you have to also spend a lot of time talking, or was it something much more, much smoother? Asking the question is answering it. It's, it's, not, it's not easy. And actually, we're the wrong people to doing it. Um, so therefore, I think if we, if we come up with the new innovations and, and, and you can promote them and you can, you can show how nice they are, um, the proof of the pudding is whether it lands in a service or in a, in, in a use case. Um, of course, the, where we are in the spectrum of, of collaboration is that the companies that are with us, they have their own model of, of deploying this technology. And uh, in our discussions with them, and they could be lengthy as well, and they, they go on for years, is to see how that changes and moves. Nobody can predict, nobody predicted the cell phone, nobody predicted the use of, of text messaging. Yeah. Uh, I was at, at Belcor, not too far away from here, and that was more than 20 years ago when we thought, you know, the video phone is something perfect. It never landed. And now we're doing Skype. And so the, the, the whole idea, we'll, we'll be doing Skype on our iPhone you know, next year. And so the, the, the whole thing is try not to predict too much. We can, we can set out roadmaps. We'll tell people we can do flexible lighting on foils that you can paste on the wall. And we can show in our labs that it can be done. The next phase then will be how it is, is, is it adopted. And, and for healthcare, even more stronger. Uh, there's, there's notorious examples of, of, of rolling out technology to the home mm -hmm. and to, to the medical field that, that um, even, not, even you know, that failed, to put it bluntly, um, because there is no acceptance. And, and we've seen in the movies, and I'm sure there's more to come, um, the communities that are asking for it. And uh, what I tend to say to, to you know, my, my colleagues is try to, to imagine the world without our technology. Push it forward and see where it can be used, and then try to come up with a scenario where people don't need it. So falsifying technology is very important for us, and I think Therefore, we do work with, with uh, I mentioned the uh, that example of, of a medical hospital. Mm -hmm. uh, these would be the, they could also be geeks. Uh, medical professionals could also be very into technology, but they will be the translator and they'll have the access to the patients and access to, and even more important in the future, to, to all of us, which are not patients yet. And if anything, we'd like to understand where that, where our technology can come in to make more preventive and predictive healthcare. Um, and, and to change the way we think about it. And that's, that's the paradigm, because today we're doing much too, ma much too many things focused only on the patients and, and the comfort of the doctor. So once we understand that, then, then we'll, we'll bring things forward. And that's our continuous uh, challenge, yeah. I'd like to now turn a question to each of you, since we're talking about change, uh, has it stopped? Or is change continuing? Is, is change something that happens once or twice and then we stop? Or is this sort of continuous? And I want to I know from each of you, 
where you're going. Uh, where is this going to lead? Is, is this the end of something, the beginning of something? Uh, are you just, uh, is it, or is this, is this something that's going to go on forever? And Joe, I know that you keep on saying you're just starting out, but how, where are you in the process? Where do you expect to be? Well, you're starting out, where, where's your end point? How long will it take to get there? And what do you need to, what do you think you need to do, given everything you know, what you well, heard here? Fundamentally, we have to turn from a very old uh, economy that was based on industries that no longer exist to a new economy that is forward-looking and bring a workforce along, the resident workforce that was, that was spent decades, generation after generation, working in semi-skilled uh, industrial settings uh, that just don't translate to new, even industry, even manufacturing is very different than it was uh, in the old uh, setting. So for us, uh, I would like to see the, the pace of change accelerate tremendously and we are doing everything we can to help existing businesses grow, uh, bring new businesses in, help uh, train the workforce through our technology. Uh, we're trying to stimulate um, use of that technology to again attract new businesses, help existing businesses grow. And I think the challenge for us is to, because time is short and the urgency is there, uh, to be as focused as possible and again incorporate in a very uh, formal way uh, all the necessary stakeholders to get everybody uh, <coughs> headed the same direction and understanding what their roles and responsibilities are and to feel accountable to the community, not just to do the things you think ought to be done, but to the rest of the community. But in a nutshell, we've got to employ, we have a very high unemployment rate, we have a high, a low educational rate, we have high poverty, uh, we're a challenged community and that's very characteristic of this part of the United States with these industries that have lost. But within easy drive, you can find communities that have gone through significant transformations and have turned around. And each community has to look at their, their own assets, uh, their own possibilities, and not try to just duplicate some, what someone else does, but find what would work in your own community. And, and uh, so change has to continue and it has to actually accelerate. And we have to do what we can now. Uh, that is understanding that we can't dictate, like you say, it's not rolling over <coughs> people. And um, in, in the United States increasingly, there is a healthy uh, skepticism about government uh, at, at all levels. And so they don't want to hear that the government, whether it's a city government, a state, or a federal government, has got the idea of what to do. It has to be much broader than just the local government. And just uh, very quickly, is now that you've done all this work and you've changed your culture, and is it the end, or is this, what do you see very quickly? What it's an ongoing process. Yeah. And uh, I think uh, there is saying things have to change to stay the same. The same quality that we pride ourselves in Vienna, for example. So we know we have to change. And we, we try to do it according to, to five principles. <coughs> Let me just say them very shortly. In, in order to make you remind them better, you know the five vowels, A, E, I, O, and U. Uh, be as up, meaning do it as soon as possible, but not quicker. Uh, be E, like encouraging. Encourage every stakeholder, be small or, sm or, or big, to have his or her say. Be inclusive, I. Take all of them with you, and don't leave people out because they might spoil your effects. And be open-minded, have a plan, but be sure that this plan is not fixed and that you can adapt it. And last of all, be upright. If you invite people to have their say, then listen to them and take their advice. Otherwise, if you can't do so, tell them beforehand and say, sorry, this is not democratic this time. This is just, we have to decide. Thanks. Sounds like a business school lecture. <laughs> well, very, it wasn't you know, intended to. Yeah, it it's was very good. <laughs> And in the future, do you, where do you see yourself going? Or you're, you said you're, you're afraid to predict, given the fact that we're Skype users now. Well, we're not right? afraid to predict. Yeah. Um, but we are, we're not afraid to be wrong as well. I mean, I think that's yeah. okay. Um, 
if you ask an engineer where things will change, yeah, of course. Um, the thing, though, is if we can if we can understand the, the, demograph, uh, the demographic change, how people change, and, and what the challenges are in different places of the world, there's there's plenty of opportunities. And um, we're talking about healthcare. There's there's a lot of developing uh, or developed areas in in this uh, in this room. There's a lot of developing areas outside of this room. I think a lot of the technology we have here is going to be deployed and maybe even faster in areas where, for instance, there's no medication at all or no med medical infrastructure at all. We've seen that happen with telecommunication. Right? We're, we're fully wired here in this place. Uh, in, in, in developing countries, wireless technology has become the thing to do. Mm -hmm. There's more, more mobile phones and medical doctors uh, in, in many, many places. And so we see a lot of uh, technology per, um, penetration in, in, in such areas. So that's, that's an interesting area to look at. And while we are trying to cope with, with how the, the, the uh, industrial infrastructure is changing in our areas, you know, moving away or changing altogether, there are some areas that, where the industry is booming. And so also there is change. So I, th I think you know, we try to understand globally what change means, then uh, there will be opportunities for us as engineers to, to continue to, uh, to help and support that. Maybe we have time to open up to just a few questions. Anybody have any questions to ask or comments to make about change? Unfortunately, uh, Gail Brewer was um, detained in, in uh, city council on budget matters, but I wondered if there's anybody who's an elected official in the audience uh, who might be able to, uh, uh, to comment on some of the, uh, the points that were discussed here, and how do you change uh, your community without getting voted out of office? Ex-politicians, how did you get voted out of office? <laughs> yeah, Rod, Rod McDonald, Geelong. Um, I, I'm still in office, so I haven't achieved the notoriety yet of being voted out, but the day will come for sure. Um, I, I think you have to be a little bit brave about things, and I guess... Everyone who goes into a public office, elected officer, has a different reason and motivation for being there. And I guess my thoughts are that if you're in there for a short time, you may as well be in there doing something and not just to occupy the space. And so I um, take the view that you have to be a bit bold and if you have a vision, you work to develop that and you go for it. And in the end, you know, you, you, you won't be there, but it's important, I think, while you're there, you do have a, have a, uh, a fair dip. And I guess that's always the challenge of meeting the challenge of the constituents and the others around, because there's always the numbers that are required to get your plan through the, the council, the parliament, whatever the situation. So I think, uh, in the end, the success will come down to whether you've read the tea leaves correctly. And uh, if uh, you've done that well, then you stay and uh, if not, well, that's it. But I think you've got to have that plan and you've got to have a conviction that what you're doing is right and you stick to it. And I think um, of my experiences with a number of uh, community groups and that you may not always agree, but if you stick to your line and you explain it, people may say, okay, we beg to differ, but at least they go away. So next time they deal with you and you tell them something, they know you're speaking from the heart as such and that uh, what you say, they take um, uh, with some value and then they make their mind up, but at least they believe that you're being straight with them and I think that's the only way to, to go. Thank you. Uh, well, we're very happy to have Gail Brewer here. Welcome. And uh, just to bring you up to date, we're talking about change and, and the kind of change that's necessary in order to bring some of the smart, intelligent technology and capabilities to a city and, and the difficulty of implementing change, what needs to be done in order to do that. And since you're a leader, really, in New York City in trying to bring this technology and this capability to a huge metropolis, maybe you could uh, tell us a little bit how you've gone about change and any examples of success and what you've learned. Thank you. I'm sorry I'm late. We are in the middle of our budget hearings, and our budget is um, $65 billion, just so you know. The only larger budgets in the United States, United States 
state of California, state of New York, and then New York City. So we're bigger than <laughs> Florida and Texas and actually half the countries in the world. So I'm sorry to be late, but we just were doing taxis and now we're up to the housing authority. So um, <laughs> I would state that in the technology world, there's two kinds. I think the mayor, of course, comes from a company that sold a product that was technologically relevant and uh, made a lot of money. And he has, uh, through 311 or other systems, 311 perhaps be a change agent in New York in the sense that it gives people opportunity to uh, get access to city government. And there's a new digital officer whom you, uh, named Rachel Stern who is uh, trying to do it from the social media perspective. Mine is slightly different, and um, with Lewis's help and your help over the last years, we've been trying to figure out how does the public get involved, because that's what's of concern to me. Just last night, we had a meeting with about 10 nonprofits, uh, academics, uh, Department of Education, because one of the big issues is uh, it's no longer called digital divide, you can call it something else, but we still have a million school children, we still have uh, all their parents, we still have seniors, we still have uh, you know, you can say broadband goes everywhere, but you can't afford it at $50 a pop per month. So how do you address all that? And what we did after hearings and hearings and hearings, we did uh, get uh, $40 million of the broadband money from Washington. And we now have schools that actually have a computer uh, that is uh, gone home and there's tons and tons and tons of software and connectivity and um, uh, lots and lots of creative curriculum to go with it. So. That was a change. In other words, we had none of that before. Uh, we also now have the notion that if you're going to have a computer training center in a neighborhood, it has to be a place that's going to be there forever, like a library. So how do you use the libraries differently? And of course, you've got this big budget crunch, uh, maybe not in Europe, but certainly in the US, regarding how do you figure out how to have connectivity in a neighborhood forever. Just today, the New York Times is a story about a developer in Brooklyn who um, right here, right nearby here, is connecting through NYC Wireless, which is our actual absolutely premier nonprofit that works to uh, connect in parks and open spaces. And the developer and NYC Wireless, again, are doing a wireless free opportunity in one of the parks. Sounds like you're probably doing it in your countries everywhere but it's not common here, unfortunately. And so I think that's what I'm trying to say. In our neck of the woods, in terms of the city council, we're trying to figure out how we can get more opportunities for people who don't have it. Could be small business, it could be the freedom and free in the parks, or it could be schools, or it could be seniors. And that's what we're working on locally. It takes years. It's a big city. Um, it's almost like a country, and so anything is slow. But I think the notion is, um, that now this group of nonprofits like NYC Wireless, like the groups working with the students and the seniors and so on, are now come together on a regular basis. And they're realizing that they have a lot to contribute to the discussion. So that's what I would say is something new. I can't tell you it happens quickly, but I can say with the federal money, it has really brought people together. And now they're thinking when the federal money ends in uh, two or three years, what's going to be the sustainable model? And that's what we're looking at now. Just, just to follow <coughs> up on that, just a minute. Is New York an intelligent community now? Is it a smart city? Is it? Depends who you yeah. ask. Mm -hmm. um, if you ask, I think that the agencies through Do It are smarter. But of course, if you talk to the small business person, we just had a hearing the other day. Um, you know, a lot of our small people, small business people don't have the hardware and the software, and so you can be smart, but you have to be able to connect affordably. So there's, you know, click, what's called one click or something, it sounds great, but if you could listen to the complaints from the people trying to use it, then you realize there's still a long way to go. So I think, you know, thanks to intelligent community members here, as well as you know, people in, in, uh, who are in the business. Um, this is a big divide between the private sector who's like got the apps and the apps and the apps, often on city data, of course, but, and then the actual people trying to make small business, parents, et cetera, trying to have that same opportunity. And it, it, I don't know how much the software hardware lack of, uh, cost, and just 
older merchants in mom and pops, for instance, they don't really feel the advantage. We're still trying to get people to see the advantage of using what you all have to offer. What, so I think that's where the challenge is. I think the city agencies are getting up to par, and we're trying to make sure that the people who are communicating with city agencies do the same. But it would be like a country trying to do something like that. We're not as intelligent as some of the people out here. <laughs> is Vienna a, an intelligent community now? Vienna's a big city. It's not as big as New York. It's a little bit smaller in Texas. It's uh, the budget. Well, um, again, it depends on how would you define smart. If you say it's green, well, yes, that part we can fulfill, also in an ecological way. If it's uh, using technologies inside the administration and for the citizens, yes, we do. Um, if you say, are we taking care of, of uh, let's say, finances in a, in a clever way, in a citizen-oriented way, yeah, well, we would try to do so. So uh, in, in, in the whole thing, I'd say, yeah, I do think we are on the way of being a smart city, but uh, this is like organizational changes. It never ends. Just very quickly, are you in smart cities or intelligent Eindhoven? Top seven, three years in a row already. <laughs> there you go. Can I say? Wait until tomorrow. There you go. Right. <laughs> We're a lot smarter than we used to be. Very good. Uh, well, we could, we could discuss this uh, for a long time. We see how important and difficult change is. It does seem to me that context makes a big difference uh, if you're starting from a position where you have a long way to go, it still takes a long time, even with the help of the utility in place. And you're getting there in a place as complex as New York City, which uh, I've, lived, I've lived in New York for a long time. I know it's very, very difficult. And it's, but Vienna, you seem to have done it pretty much. Eindhoven, you're very far along the way. And so context makes a difference. I think what we've seen in this uh, short time is that uh, you have technology, but then you need change. And change demands a lot more than just technology. It demands uh, getting really the support of stakeholders from, uh, from across all, all of society. And that takes, that takes a lot more time than just implementing technology. You need organizations that can learn. And we've seen that that's very important. Uh, people have, have used the term open, open innovation, open access, access to technology. And I think that's another thing that we've seen is very, very important. And we have to learn from all the sources of change and innovation that are around us. And all these communities have shown us that this pathway is complex, but indeed change is possible. I want to thank everyone very much, the whole panel. Thank you. Thank you.